Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a beautiful afternoon here in Illinois, and I hope where you are as well. I'm delighted to see from the poll results that we have a good representation from state-level folks as well as uh, DC folks. So, uh, so I hope this uh, webinar will be of use to you. I'm going to give a broad overview of uh, non-point source pollution policy uh, and, and developments, uh, innovations in that policy. And then Professor Secchi is going to follow with, uh, by drilling down in some elements of, of what I will talk about. So without further ado, let's proceed. Uh, I also note once again the link to the uh, choices volume that uh, contains the papers underlying these presentations. What is non-point source pollution? Well, um, the Clean Water Act provides a distinction between concentrated sources of pollution and dispersed or diffuse sources of pollution. Well, uh, once again, let me just point to the distinction between concentrated sources of pollution and diffuse sources. Uh, diffuse sources are those that arise from landscape-based sources through wind or storm act activity uh, for the most part, and they are uh, distinctive in that they are very difficult to measure, monitor, and enforce. It's tough to know where the pollution is coming from, what activities are giving rise to it, and where it is going. So, um, so this difficulty of, of figuring out what is going on and who's causing it is the distinguishing feature of diffuse source pollution. An ex a, a big example of, of a system that is driven by non-point source pollution is the Chesapeake Bay, where high nutrient loads as well as uh, high sediment loads are causing the waters to be opaque, to, al to suffer uh, algae blooms, and both of these things degrade the habitat for, uh, for bottom dwelling and uh, organisms and fish and uh, results in, in a bay that is not healthy and, uh, and may be uh, going through a process of eutrophication or aging at an accelerated rate. When we look at the causes of the Chesapeake Bay problem, uh, we, uh, an analysis that has been done scientifically shows that the majority of the pollutants are coming from landscape-based sources. Uh, in this pie chart, I distinguish the bright red segment and the blue segment, which are the point source elements of the problem, from all the other segments that are, uh, that are non-point sources. And you will see that the non-point sources account for nearly 60% of, uh, of the pollutants entering the Chesapeake Bay. And this is just uh, illustrative of the way in which non-point source pollution may be a, a major cause of environmental degradation. Why is this important? Well, in the most recent uh, EPA uh, survey of the nation's surface waters, uh, it was concluded that uh, nationwide about 55% of our surface waters are in poor condition and less than half of them are in good or fair condition. By poor condition, we're mean, we mean that the water quality is not sufficient to, to enable the uses that these water bodies are supposed to support. The major limitations that are impeding these poor water bodies are nutrients, particularly phosphorus and nitrogen, as well as poor fish habitat, which is in many cases driven by sedimentation. So nutrients and sediments are major uh, contributing factors to poor water quality nationwide, and these are contaminants that are significantly driven by non-point sources. Uh, geographically across the United States, we see that the water quality is generally better in the western part of the country, where only 30% of the water bodies were rated as poor in the middle part of the country, uh, uh, nearly 60%, and the eastern highlands, as, as well as the Ozarks, more than 60% of the surface waters were judged to be in poor condition. Now let me step back, having uh, laid groundwork in terms of what non-point source pollution is and why it's a problem, to think about the principles that, that guide our policy. 
In the first place, we need to understand who has rights to use the environment. Should polluters have the right in this, in this nation of liberty and, and freedom to do what they want and, and contaminate as they will? Or should consumers and the public in general be protected? Um, and should we conceive the environment as a, a public right? Uh, in fact, our environmental legislation has taken the, the latter posture viewing the environment as a public resource uh, for which uh, we have a responsibility to provide protection. Uh, along these lines, um, whether the polluter is supposed to pay for environmental damages and uh, measures to prevent those damages, or whether we should have to pay the polluter to get them to, uh, to take action, once again, our, our legislative and and uh, legal environment supports the polluter pays principle. But it is also true that uh, pollution problems are not always easily solved. It's not, especially with non-point source pollution, it's not easy to know who's causing the problems, how great the problems are, and what it's going to cost to solve them. So it's costly to, to bring about solutions to these problems. And, uh, and the question arises, are the benefits of solving the problems uh, proportionate to the costs of solution? And in some cases, we may leave, leave some problems only partially solved because the cost of achieving a full solution would be too great. Now let's look at the, uh, at the federal policy environment surrounding uh, non-point source pollution. I've already mentioned the Clean Water Act. Uh, as amended in 1987, it regulates point sources. These are industrial and municipal sources of pollution. But it leaves non-point sources largely unregulated while promoting voluntary measures to uh, reduce non-point source pollution. An exception or a, sort of a hybrid to these two classes of, of sources are confined animal feeding operations, also known as CAFOs which release manure, which is then spread on, on fields. And the question is, is this a point source or non-point source? Increasingly, regulations are recognizing CAFOs as point sources and regulating them as point sources. Uh, the, the Clean Water Act and also other sources provide grants to states for non-point source reduction measures. Um, the Clean Water Act provides for a process called total maximum daily load allocations in water bodies that do not achieve quality levels that support the designated uses. States are obligated to uh, conduct a study and assign further load reductions to point sources sufficient to achieve the uh, designated water quality standards. Um, non-point sources as a class are generally also outside this TMDL process, which in some cases means that point sources have to achieve extraordinary levels of pollution reduction in order to support the TMDL because non-point sources are, are, uh, are not regulated. The Clean Water Act regulates wetlands uh, modifications with a no net loss uh, philosophy. I'll return to this. The Clean Water Act also supports water quality trading programs. These are programs that encourage uh, largely point sources to uh, arra make arrangements with non-point sources for the non-point sources to reduce their emissions in return for point sources not having to, to, uh, to implement extremely expensive pollution uh, mitigation. Again, I'll return to that. Uh, an example of this trading process is with wetlands banking. Under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, uh, there is a no net loss policy for uh, wetlands. Uh, that means if a wetland is uh, degraded or, or uh, filled in, there has to be compensating improvements elsewhere. And, and uh, wetlands banks have been established to facilitate this process of improving or creating new wetlands as a me measure for mitigating the loss of existing wetlands. They've proven to be very successful in the last 25 years. 
They've grown from largely uh, activity in the east of the United States to activities all across the country. More than 500 uh, mitigation banks exist as of a few years ago. So this has been a great success story of water quality trading. In addition to EPA-oriented programs, the USDA has a long-standing interest in conservation. Most recently, for the last 20 years or so, the focus has been on uh, uh, getting land set aside for conservation purposes, taken out of production and devoted to conservation, while also supporting um, uh, conserving management practices on working land. The Natural Resource Conservation Service is USDA's lead technical agency for these programs. Under the Coastal Zone Management Act, NOAA also has the capacity to support coastal areas to implement uh, measures to reduce non-point source pollution. But in the end, states have primacy over land use, non-navigable rivers, that is rivers where the Corps of Engineers is not, not involved, and most lakes. So states have a very important leadership uh, responsibility with, not, with respect to non-point source pollution. Recently, we have seen evolution of the Clean Water Act. Uh, there's been increasing uh, regulation of, of CAFOs. Uh, municipal stormwater has been subject to increasing regulation. Uh, construction and site development activities. Many, many of you may realize that you're seeing more hay bales and sediment curtains out in the landscape. Well, that's due to evolution of the, uh, of the provisions of the Clean Water Act. Uh, basin scale watershed implementation plans are basically efforts to engage states that are jointly involved in basin scale problems like the Chesapeake Bay or the, or the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico to come together uh, to develop plans to improve the whole basin and to depend on state authorities to implement those plans. Tribes have been given uh, the right to regulate water quality upstream of tribal uh, lands uh, in instances where the quality of water on the, on, the, on the tribal land depends on what's going off land. So uh, this has been an extension of uh, Clean Water Act authority. The 2014 Farm Bill recently passed reorients uh, USDA conservation programs not entirely, but to some degree, from the easement approach back to working lands in recognition that there's been a lot of market pressure to, to produce on agricultural lands. So we're back to an era when we're going to be working more on, on working agricultural land. There have been innovations at the state level, uh, manure restrictions in some states, uh, setback requirements along streams, lakes, and rivers uh, in others, uh, and uh, enhanced phosphorus reduction efforts and best management practices where, uh, in this instance, the, the Everglades has been a major area of policy development. I call your attention to the article by Kathy Kling in the, in the Choices volume where there's an effort to catalog many of the state level innovative uh, programs. At the local level, we see uh, innovations, uh, water quality trading uh, beyond the wetlands uh, uh, environment. Uh, there have been lots of projects to bring about water quality trading to deal with a variety of pollutants, uh, largely nutrients in nutrient uh, restricted water bodies. Uh, in reality, there have been relatively few successful active trading programs. One of the few is in the, in the uh, lower Miami River Basin in southwestern Ohio. There's also a, a, a very successful instance in Ontario and Canada. But there's a lot more to, uh, to be done there, and uh, that's an area of potential policy development in the future. Along these lines, in the Ohio River Basin, a system has been set up where farmers, landowners can undertake conservation measures now and get certified stewardship credits that then could be sold later on a market when a market arises. In some instances, locally, payments are being made for environmental services. Uh, 
the American Farmland Trust developed a system for ensuring yields on lands where water quality oriented best management practices were being implemented. Uh, in Florida, there have been payments for on-site water and phosphorus retention beyond re regulated limits. Um, in urban areas, we're seeing a lot of interest in low impact stormwater retention measures to keep water out of, of uh, pipe sewer systems and reduce treatment requirements. So bioswales, uh, urban rain gardens, rain barrels are, uh, are being supported in many cities uh, as well as, as acquiring areas for detention and, uh, and recycling of water. Uh, there are uh, links now between non-point source pollution and greenhouse gas policies. Under California's uh, 2006 uh, uh, Act, there's a cap and trade program where uh, those who wish to emit carbon can purchase uh, uh, credits from those who wish to sequester carbon through reforestation or permanent uh, crops on agricultural land. The American Carbon Registry is developing methods to quantify and certify those carbon offsets. And in the mid-Atlantic mid and Northeast, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative allows for carbon offsets from forestry and manure managements as part of the, uh, the carbon cap. We must acknowledge, however, that there are potential conflicts between carbon policies and, uh, and non-point source pollution as as exhibited by biofuels policies that have encouraged corn production uh, to produce ethanol. Uh, the corn production means that we have more acres of a, of a crop that uses lots of fertilizers and is erosion prone. And so there may be some negative uh, non-point source pollution consequences of that uh, carbon policy. Uh, briefly, in Europe, uh, they face similar challenges uh, they have been more inclined to use subsidies or payments to polluters uh, to, to address these problems. Uh, like in the United States, the, the member states the, in the uh, European Union have primacy over, over land use and non-point source pollution. Uh, Europeans have more, been more willing to use auction mechanisms, not just markets, as ways of accomplishing uh, non-point source reduction at lower cost. Um, at this point, I wish to uh, remind you once again of the choices uh, issue, and uh, then I will uh, turn over the mic, I think, back to Karen first, and then on to Professor Secchi. And again, thank you for being with us today.